Hey everybody, it's Reggie with Lawyer Interviews, and today we are talking to the amazing Molly Palmer, who is both a crim defense attorney and law professor at Emory Law. Hi Molly, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, Molly, first off, I love your Instagram account and your social media presence, but second, you are just doing interviews like crazy all over the place. Uh, you make appearances, do commentary. How did you get into that from, you know, originally practicing law? Yeah, so I am a legal analyst. I do a, probably between 10 and 20 hours of television a week these days. And that's mostly because right now we have so many exciting trials, you know, Jussie Smollett, Ghislaine Maxwell, we just wrapped up um, the Greg McMichaels, Travis McMichaels, Kyle Rittenhouse. So right now I'm doing a ton, but I started when I went into private practice, um, I, I basically was found by Court TV through LinkedIn. Um, I think that they were just scouting for people because they're located here in Atlanta where I practice. Right. So pre-pandemic, they wanted lawyers, local lawyers to come into the studio. So that's how I started. They found me and had me come in. And um, it's something I always wanted to do. I actually, I was a child actor. So I, I, <laughs> I love I love performing, surprise, surprise. And um, when I had the opportunity, you know, I took it and ran with it, certainly tried my best every time I was there and continued to be asked to come back. And then through that, I kind of leveraged um, having some representation. So now I have a team of people that books me on all the major networks. I basically get um, texts or emails or phone calls saying, hey, can you do this uh, in like the next hour? And I just... <laughs> You know, be, be like, yeah. <laughs> like an hour. Okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how it is these days. So especially when it's, you know, the 24 hour news cycle and these live trials, mm -hmm. if a verdict comes down, I get a bunch of text messages and they say, hey, can you, are you ready to do a Skype interview with NBC? And you say, yes, I am. And that's how I it love it. That's fantastic. And I've seen, I've seen you as well on TV and it's just amazing. It's so fun to well, also, I love to watch when we've got actual attorneys who practice who are giving their opinions, you know, rather than, you know, I guess other people who may not have the same opinion. How long did you practice uh, law before you decided to get into, uh, you know, commentary work? Well, I was a public defender for almost eight years. So as a public defender, you don't speak to the media. And it was incredibly important for me to be a public defender. And I still identify in many ways as a public defender and have the utmost respect for those who do that work. Um, but at the same time, I knew when, if and when I went into private practice, a big part of what I wanted to do was be a legal commentator because for me, it's interesting. I grew up during the time of Nancy Grace and she right. was a district attorney in the same, one of the same jurisdictions where I was a public defender. Oh. And I always thought, you know, um, that what was being presented in terms of the media, you know, 10 years ago, it was certainly biased toward the, the government and the prosecution. Mm -hmm. And as a public defender, I saw so much in, that I thought the public should know about just the imbalance of power and how oppressive criminal prosecutions can be and how they target the marginalized. And it was just a something, it was a platform I wanted to stand on and present to the world. And coincidentally, at the same time, for whatever reason, a couple of years ago, people started to care about the same stuff I've been talking about forever. Police brutality, uh, over prosecution of um, you know, certain races and classes and genders. And so the timing just kind of worked out like people started actually caring about these issues and there seemed to be some room for somebody from a defense perspective to analyze criminal cases and legal news right well and i've, I've said too I, I did a little bit of public defense work at law school and it, it's very very hard work so first off i think that crim defense attorneys and especially public defenders are just the defenders of the constitution and so when you say that people all of a sudden are taking an interest and especially wanting to know the defense side. What do you think sparked that change? Um, I think cell phones, so in social media. So when I was in law school and I went, you know, I went to Emory and it's it's pretty back back then, and I think still now, the focus is a lot on getting into corporate law, securities litigation, that kind of stuff. Um, and so I was one of the few people in my class that wanted to be a public defender, and this was over 10 years ago. 
Um, but also at the same time, like, I think Instagram was just brand new. I mean, I, we weren't tethered to our cell phones as much, you know, I was an older student I was a non-traditional student. So I was definitely less connected. And I think in recent years, society has shifted to the point where, you know, we are recording whatever's happening and we are sharing it vastly and widely. And so when it comes to things like instances of police brutality or how a traffic stop goes, if you're a black man, all of a sudden we saw it, we had documentation before it was happening, but people didn't really want to believe it. You know, you have to, sometimes you have to see it to believe it. And when it comes to some of the, I think, you know, the way the system, the criminal system, uh, how it treats certain people, we just couldn't believe it until we saw it with our very own eyes. And I think that shift in terms of social media, cell phone, video, resulted in society saying, you know what, now that I've seen this, we can't stand for this anymore. But trust me, it's been going on for a long, long time. Right. I mean, yeah, before we're dealing with testimony of officers and then probably the person on trial. And so, you know, you've got a credibility situation, but I mean, I agree. I I think that, you know, cell phones have led to body cams and a lot of information that maybe the public or juries didn't have. I think it's really, really cool to see um, sometimes the truth, you know, when it it can get lost, you know? So I I, I think that's a great like observation as well. Do you think that they're is going to be any change to laws because of this, uh, you know, new impacts of social media where we're reco- recording everything 24 seven. You know, one thing that I hope to see change and one thing that I have, I do think can change is kind of the role of the prosecutor. I think they're under more scrutiny than they've ever been <laughs> in the history of the profession, you know, with the death of Ahmad Arbery in my state um, in Georgia, you know, usually there's no consequence for a prosecutor who makes some decision, uh, whether it is to believe her officer over, you know, what maybe the facts or the evidence actually show, or whether it is to push a case or not push a case, to choose to prosecute versus to choose to dismiss, you know, they're untouchable. And I feel like now, you know, we saw Jackie Johnson, the DA, who was originally assigned to investigate the Travis McMichaels, uh, Greg McMichaels, Roddy Bryant case, the death of Ahmaud Arbery, and said, you know, Greg McMichaels is my former employee. He's an investigator at the DEA's office, former investigator, and I'm not going to choose to prosecute him. And then she got criminally indicted. That's novel. That is new. We don't see that. I do. um, I'm on the board of the Georgia Innocence Project, and you have people that lose decades of their life, and there's no consequence for the prosecutor that withheld evidence or had some substantial role in that happening. But I hope and I, I like to believe that what we're now doing with our new view of the criminal system is putting a little bit more accountability on those who have the power. And I think the indictment of Jackie Johnson and generally people caring a bit more and maybe um, you know, exercising their right to vote in these local elections for district attorneys will shift and will have a bit more um, accountability in that realm that we have never had before. And that's a really interesting perspective, too, because, you know, attorneys, we all have these ethical rules and accountability rules anyway that we should follow. But you know, who's there to check sometimes? Right. And so I think that's a very, very interesting and like you said, novel situation where a prosecutor needs to use better judgment and, you know, better um I don't know, scruples when it comes to who they charge and the connections. So, I mean, and you're in a very interesting state as well that's had some really big cases uh, come out. I mean, how how has that impacted, you think, your local elections and what you've seen around where you're at? Well, you know, I don't know. And, and for me, it's interesting because I know, you know, when it, it, when it comes to the state you practice in and you're in a niche area like criminal defense, you know all of the players, right? You know everybody who's in that courtroom. And I certainly believe that everybody has the right to a zealous, aggressive defense. You know, I don't don't want less due process for anybody, right? Right. I want more due process for those who typically haven't gotten it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I do think it's interesting because there have been more, um, like, kind of progressive prosecutors or, or self-proclaimed progressive prosecutors running for election. People that I you know, know used to be defense lawyers or public defenders. And that's what we saw happen um, 
with Jackie Johnson in Brunswick, Georgia, she was voted out before she was criminally indicted. And in her place was Keith Higgins, and he's a former defense lawyer. And, right. you know, I, I do think that when the landscape changes and you think, hey, maybe I have a chance to have this position, even though I'm not hardline law and order, then you run and then society is ready for you to be elected and you get voted in. So I think I have seen a shift in terms of those people who are seeking candidacy for some of these positions in a state where typically if you were a defense lawyer, you didn't stand a chance. Right, right. And I, I think that's a neat trend too, to see that because a lot of prosecutors do go into politics. I think that's kind of been the age old um, transition for a lot of people. So I, I'm loving seeing all the defenders coming in and running as well. I, and I, I think that's also nationwide not just specific to Georgia, but I love it too. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the Innocence Project. I think it's such an amazing organization. I'd love you to talk about what you do and how you got involved. Sure, so I am on the executive board of the Georgia Innocence Project. Yeah. The Innocence Project in New York, well-funded, huge staff, lots of resources. We yeah. are an independent nonprofit here in this state focused on DNA exonerations of the wrongfully convicted in Georgia. Um, I got involved because um, when I was a little, well, a little baby law student, I didn't really know what I wanted to do and was very open-minded, like always. I thought maybe I'd be a patent lawyer because I have a background. I have a um, bachelor's of science from a, a Georgia Tech and didn't really like a lot of what I was kind of experiencing and kind of the corporate law vibe. So I talked to one of my professors um, who I really respected, my constitutional law professor, and was like, listen, I'm kind of over this. What should I do? Um, you know, I don't have any lawyers in my family, uh, but she knew me. She knew me uh, pretty, pretty well. And she was like, Molly, why don't you take an internship at the Georgia Innocence Project? She was on the board. She's still on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of rearranged my schedule and was an intern and it changed everything. After that, I knew I was gonna be a public defender. I knew that this was not just my cause, but my identity, everything kind of fell into place. And um, I, you know, I was just very involved at the time, you know, it was in like a rundown office next to a bowling alley. We had nothing, we had no money, you know, and it, what a daunting task to exonerate the wrongly convicted in Georgia. Trust me, there are plenty of wrongly convicted people in this state. Yeah. Um, so it was great, you know, it was really like, it was real work. We were reading transcripts and trying to track down evidence and calling district attorneys in these small counties and saying, hey, do you still have those pants from the crime scene? Because basically what we do is we find evidence and we do DNA testing that never had been done. And right. so that's exclusively our work. So it's kind of incontrovertible. The, these people are actually innocent. Right. Um, so then I always stayed involved. And a couple of years ago, I was asked to be on the board and then the executive board. And now I've taken a role, I am, I'm very involved. Like right now I'm working um, with a state representative to try and push some bills through the next, next legislative session to try and get compensation for exonerees. One thing we don't have in this state and particularly compensation for one exoneree that I'm representing. And so I'm very involved now and, and the organization is growing. We now have a new office, we have a larger staff, Awesome. But certainly, you know, it still is a very tiny independent nonprofit here in the state and one that I'm incredibly proud to be a part of. That's amazing. And I, I don't know if you can share any stories or anything like that, but have you, I mean, how many people do you think that in your time you've seen actually exonerated and released? Well, Georgia Innocence Project, in the past few years, we've had a number of people exonerated and released. We, we've had more in the past few years than we had in probably many years prior combined. Um, you know, I'll just say that every case is pretty harrowing. Um, in the past couple of years, for example, we worked to exonerate Johnny Lee Gates, and he spent 42 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And part of that was on death row. Oh my gosh, years. that's insane. Years. So, you know, and there is no compensation. You no. Know, there are certain, you know, like I said, we're trying to, you know, move some efforts forward, but you, when you lose 42 years of your life and all of these exonerees, you know, I get to know them personally, they're so grateful. There is no bitterness. And that I think is just an incredible thing to be around um, as a human being that, you know, somebody no matter what the world has done to you, there's still room for like positivity and gratitude. 
And that's got to so, be so hard when the system has, I mean, like you said, I put you away for 42 years. That's your life. I mean, those are probably your, your, your years of fun and years of growth. And you've been behind bars wrongfully convicted. I can't imagine having gratitude. So I think that's so amazing that you're able to see that and that these individuals are able to have gratitude in that kind of a situation. That's so amazing to hear. Um, how do people get involved? Like if, if someone wanted to get involved with the Georgia Innocence Project, how would you, how can they contact or donate? What's the best way for them to get involved? Really, the number one thing is donation. Like that, you know, for us, and we, we lay it all out on our website. If you Google Georgia Innocence Project, we describe how just small amounts of money can help us get a transcript, can help us, you know, just with basic operational costs, which we're still kind of, you know, trying to meet year by year. Um, so really it is donations first and foremost, join our mailing list. Sometimes we have events with exonerees, um, but really uh, for the most part, it, it, we function on, we're a nonprofit and, and we, we function on people giving us money so that we can actually do the work step by step. But certainly like, you know, you can follow us on social media, keep up with whatever we're doing. We always do something for wrongful conviction day in October. Sometimes we do um, pretty interesting Zooms with the exonerees, a variety of things every year. But really, if you wanna become a donor, we would be more than happy <laughs> to receive your philanthropic donation. Absolutely, I mean, nonprofits, you've gotta, you've gotta donate to them because they cannot keep up their good work without donations. So that's just how it works and agreed. So everyone go follow <laughs> and donate, please. Um, I'd also love to talk about, you're a professor as well. I mean, you are like the Renaissance woman, I love it. So you, you teach at Emory Law, what do you teach? And how'd you get involved in teaching from being both an attorney and a commentator? So I teach advanced criminal trial advocacy. It's a class for three L's, um, small class of 12 students. Um, I, well, I was a teacher before law school. I taught special ed for five years. I, I am a teacher. Like there's something about it. I think that that, I was a professor before I was doing the legal commentary stuff. And I think that they kind of dovetail into each other. You know, I'm explaining, <laughs> I'm breaking something down on a level that hopefully is understandable and meaningful, right? That's what a, that's what a good teacher does. Um, it is probably by far one of my favorite things I do. Like, look, it's fun to be on TV, be in a studio. It's fun to, you know, I've traveled the world to investigate cases. I get to speak at conferences at some of the coolest places across the country. But my favorite thing at the end of the day is teaching this little class of three L's. Oh, wow. um, and I got involved because I am, well, I'm very academic. I'm kind of like that kind of person. And I've always been very involved in Murray Law. I'm on their board as well. And um, they have a pretty robust adjunct professor uh, roster these days. Uh, and basically all of us are practitioners. I, I guess law schools should be doing this. They, they wanna show a bit more what actual practice is rather than just theory. So right. I was asked um, a few years ago, would I take over this class that um, I actually took as a 3L and loved. And I said, happily I will. And basically what it is, is um, taking, well, it's mostly focused on federal practice, which is most of what I do. Uh, it's basically taking a case from the moment you have it all the way through trial. And it's for students who not only want to be defense lawyers, but also prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And it culminates in um, like a final trial. So it's like the highlight of my life. Really, yeah. just in the class of it. You get to be the judge during like the, do they do like a mock trial at the end? Do you get to be the judge? I I choose not to be the judge. I don't <laughs> All right. outside lawyers to be the judge because I don't know if that's fair, you know? Um, yeah, that's we juries, but usually we do like kind of a bench trial and I get other practitioners. We also have a lot of great guest speakers. We do, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Like part of the class is direct instruction and doing the exercises and doing the, you know, cross examinations or anything like that. But then we also do have like this incredible group of guest speakers. Some of the, the most prominent people in criminal law locally come in and talk and you know tell the kids like <laughs> there's a lot of us who really enjoy this you know right. don't don't think you're entering a, pr a profession that's miserable you know right. we like this so judges prosecutors defense lawyers fbi agents they all come in and talk about their work and hopefully the goal is that the class feels somewhat like capable <laughs> as an yeah. actual practitioner and optimistic about you know the field of of law they're going into that's amazing. And practical skills in law school. I think their schools are starting to come around, but like, even when I went, I mean, they just didn't teach like 
the practice, they teach the law, right? So I love when people are like, I got to take a class where I had to do a full trial. I'm like, that's amazing. That's fantastic. So I love that you get to teach that. What's, what's a piece of like, if you were to give these, this group of students, you've got one piece of advice when they're going out into crim law, whether it's defense or prosecution, what would that be? You know, I always try and, you know, I would say be yourself. And that's kind of for anybody. It's really interesting these days. One thing I've noticed, like this kind of a generational chasm between like, I consider myself Gen X, but, you know, I think with young kids, there's this tendency to emulate and uh, imitate a little bit. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if that's because of like social media and you can find somebody that's doing what you think you want to do. And then you want to be like them. But I would say for a number of reasons, don't do that figure out who you are, you know, and, and the kind of lawyer you're going to be and just unapologetically be it. And that also helps because there are lawyers in this, you know, in this world that are terrible. And they're the ones who are earning the reputation that we have for being like anti-intellectual megalomaniac, just like the worst people. Mm -hmm. So if you are confident in yourself, you know, I think that you are, you become quickly well-recognized because law is about creativity and independent thought. You know, it's those those approaches to a case that, that take the litigation the furthest. They're the ones that, that the question presented is like so good that it actually shifts the paradigm, right? So be yourself, be totally unique and unapologetic in that because I think juries like it, judges like it, clients like it. And, you know, when you're faced with people that are judgmental and insecure and, you know, whatever kind of lawyer they are, it just helps you kind of manage the day-to-day -day existence in the life of a lawyer. Yes, absolutely. And I think unapologetic. I love that because it also shows a level of confidence. And I think if you're, you know, representing a client, I think showing that to the client goes, that attorney believes in my case, that attorney believes in themselves. And I think that that's a really big thing for clients. So I love, I love the unapologetic advice. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, you know, people are like, oh, you're so confident. I'm like, well, don't mistake my fearlessness for confidence. I'm just not, I've not, I've never been a fearful person. I'm not really afraid of anything. And so I think if you move, you, and I think you have to know yourself to be like that, but if you move through life like that, you know, you're relatively untouchable. Right. I agree. I love it. <laughs> well, I also want to ask you uh, if you've got any stories you could share with us or a story of maybe like the funniest moment or funniest story you've heard in crim defense. <laughs> So this is a story. So this isn't a case that I handled, but before I went out in private practice, I was a federal defender in the Atlanta office, which is an incredible office. And um, I was, uh, I ran the intern program and we would always talk about different kinds of cases that we had when we did the orientation. And my favorite story that was shared with the interns in preparing them for the variety of uh, criminal matters they may handle uh, involves an airport case, right? So for federal, it has to have some kind of jurisdictional hook, right? It has to be something that, uh, involves more than one state or something about the case makes it um, not a state case, but a federal case. And so we have a lot of airport cases. Airport is considered a the functional equivalent of the border. So here in Atlanta, we have the busiest airport in the world. And we have a lot of cases that stem from somebody doing something uh, allegedly illegal in the airport. And, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, we deal with um, uh, sometimes like, you know, people smuggle a lot of stuff in a lot of different ways. Oh, cool. <laughs> so my favorite story involves a violation of basically exotic animal law, <gasps> which I'm also dealing with in another case that I'm not going to mention just yet, but you'll, you'll see in the near future. But uh, yeah. so this, this case involved a man who was coming from South America to arrive in the Atlanta airport undetected with like a hundred exotic birds, you know, and these are little birds. <laughs> These are little birds. So how do you do this, right? And I love like the ingenuity and the creativity when it comes to crime. Like I'm very, you know, I love my clients. I love to learn about my cases. I think it's cool. I think it takes a certain kind of mind <laughs> to attempt to evade the law. And I'm interested in that always. Entrepreneurs, so for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this man was like, well, how am I going to get these 100 birds, you know, on a flight from South America to Atlanta? Well, he made special pants that had like a hundred pockets and then he sedated the birds. Oh my. <laughs> and he put the birds in the pants. And, but here's the thing, obviously this man got caught and he was arrested and that's why the federal defender got involved. Right. What happened? Right. During the flight, the birds woke up. 
Oh my. <laughs> and so, so I think about, I think about like that whole situation. I love to think about like, you're in a, first of all, you're the man, right. And you can feel like the birds waking up and that's a whole thing. And then right. what about if you're like another passenger and you don't, you're trying to figure out what's going on. But then I really think the funny thing is like, what if you're the bird? Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, and you're like sewn into some pants, but anyway, <laughs> I don't know what happened with that case. I'm sure we had excellent representation and got off, but that's one of my favorite, <laughs> uh, favorite federal criminal defense stories is the, the exotic birds smuggling the pants. That's amazing. I mean, but also very, very, very genius. I mean, I'm, you know, IP, I'm like, man, he should have gotten those pants patented for bird smuggling. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> or any kind of any kind of smuggling. Like the yeah. you know, he made these pants himself. So like I said, I love the creativity involved in the work. Agreed. Well, that's that's really funny, actually. <laughs> and just like the airport, you know, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I'm sure that there are some interesting smuggling cases out of ATL. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, that's yeah, that case is the tip of the iceberg. That is so funny. Well, I would also love to ask you a few more questions about. Uh, you know, TV. Okay. So you mentioned that you had done some child acting. So I'm assuming you, you know, you're, you're kind of into media, watch shows. If you were to pick a TV crim defense attorney to represent you, who would you pick? Oh, like a real attorney that, uh, that does like legal commentary, like I do. Or no, just like uh, on TV, like an actor, like Listen, a role. <laughs> I mean, I, I love Elle Woods. I will yes. never just, I love Elle Woods because again, the unapologetically herself. Yes. I love, I love an academic. Mm -hmm. I love the Harvard law. I respect the high-end academics all day long. I like that she decided to still be very female and have cute outfits and that didn't minimize her intellectual capabilities. And she did like the indigent defense clinic where she defended the murderer. Like for me, no one's gonna be better than Elle Woods. And I feel like she and I at the defense table, it's a guaranteed not guilty. Right? Love it. I love it. I love it. Well, Molly, thank you so much for joining us today. And please, if you don't mind throwing up all of your social handles so that our viewers can follow you and also with the Georgia Innocence Project, we'd love to have you let us know where we can find you and follow. Sure. So my main, as you know, my main kind of social media is Instagram at Molly Parmer, Facebook Parmer Criminal Defense. I do have a TikTok Atlanta lawyer. I don't really do it. It kind of got overwhelming. Um, and www.parmer, P-A-R-M-E-R dot -E law is my website. Uh, Georgia Innocence Project, just Google Georgia Innocence Project and it will come right up. Sometimes we go by G-I-P. Uh, and that, I think that's pretty much it. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Molly. Thanks for joining us. And I know you've probably got about 3,000 more interviews today. So I appreciate you waking up with us. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks. And thanks everyone for watching Lawyer Interviews and we'll see you next time.